In the last video, we started our study of language endangerment, the process where speakers of minority languages are forced to stop speaking their languages. In this video, we'll study language shift, which is what happens to a language and the community where it's spoken once its language becomes discriminated. We'll also talk about language vitality, which is how to measure how the language is doing. All right, so I want to ask you a question. What do you use English for? In what contexts of your life do you use English? You probably use it to communicate using technology. You use it on your phone, you use it to Google things. You probably use English to communicate with the regional government of New Hampshire, also with the uh, authorities at the university. You also use English to look for, for jokes, for TV shows, to watch comedies. You use English as a language to learn about the world, a language for science and for culture. You use English for news, uh, to read news about the world, newspapers, news, access to media. You probably also use English to write messages to your friends and family. Maybe you use English in the community where you live. Uh, to have conversations and to conduct business. You might use English at home but with your parents, with your siblings, and so forth. You might use English in ceremonies of your culture, for example, Christmas or Thanksgiving. Maybe this is the language in which these uh, ceremonies are conducted. Maybe you use language for, for food. Maybe you have foods that you've always loved, like apple pie or stuffing and things like that. So all of these are domains of usage. These are different domains where you could use the English language if your first language is English. What happens when people are discriminated against because of their language is that one by one, these domains of usage get taken away from them. Essentially, maybe they cannot use their indigenous language for technology. They have to use the, the phone in English and not in Navajo, for example. Maybe there aren't a lot of, of shows, of jokes, uh, of movies that they can watch in, the, in an indigenous language. So each one of these domains is important because this is one place where we can use our language. And language shift is the process by which the language recedes from each of these domains. So may, there may be communities where, for example, only uh, the colonial language is used for things like technology, entertainment, and so forth. And uh, the language of the home, the indigenous language, is used for things like communicating with your family and cultural ceremonies of your community or for the names of food. If the discrimination gets really bad, eventually the language will start receding from every single one of these domains to the point where um, the children will, will speak with their siblings in English as opposed to an indigenous language, or maybe even to their parents in, in English instead of the indigenous language. Once things get there, something uh, very sad happens. Um, this is a language like uh, a class A language is a language like English, where every generation speaks the language, including small children. However, if a language is discriminated against, then it's going to recede from technology, from jokes, from culture, from use with uh, the government, from use in the market, from use with your family, until there is a generation of parents that will not use it with their children. Again, for all the structural conditions that we discussed in the previous video, because they want to spare them from the pain of being discriminated against. So there will be a generation of parents that will not speak it to their children. And so the children will only speak uh, the majority language and only the parents and the grandparents are going to speak the indigenous language. If you fast forward to 20 years, then the parents will have become grandparents. And then you will have a generation of parents and children who don't speak the language. And again, it's not because they didn't mean to. It's not their fault. It's because the grandparents wanted to spare them the pain of discrimination. Fast forward 20 more years, and then only a few elders will speak the, lang the minority language. And all of these generations below are not going to speak the minority language, only the majority one for the community. And then these few elders will die. 
when that happens, there will be nobody in the community who was born speaking the language. The language will become dormant. By the way, we don't say that it's extinct because there is a possibility that there will be records of the language, like books, like letters, like dictionaries, and that in the future, someone will reawaken the language and teach it again to the children. We'll see examples of exactly this in a couple of videos. So after everyone who learned it as a first, as their native language dies as their first language, the language becomes dormant. And this is how languages get displaced. As these things happen, you, uh, when you don't have any more uh, L1 speakers, there are people who kind of heard the language from their grandparents, from the, from the elders, and remember a little bit. We call them remembers. And as this process happens, the language also undergoes forms of simplification. It loses parts of its phonological inventory. It changes its syntax so it can resemble the majority language more. Um, you tend to lose morphological complexity. So where you have some morphological categories, you now have fewer. And in general, um, the system starts simplifying and resembling the majority language or simply breaking apart until no one can remember what, what the language was like. This is an example. This language is Gaelic, which is spoken in Wales in Britain. And Gaelic has a lot of ways in which it can make the plurals for words. For example, you can add a suffix to the word, like from preg, lie, pregen, lies. You can add the suffix, but there's other mechanisms. For example, you can have a phonological change of a component. In punt, that means pound. Punch, pounds. The last sound has changed. You can have suppletion of the root, change, uh, having a completely irregular change, like having te, houses, become tror, houses. You can have ablaut, an internal change of the root, going from mak, sun, to mick, sons. And you can have a bunch of these combined. You can have ablaut and deletion of certain uh, sounds like this schwa and adding a suffix. So tares is door, torsen is doors. And there's a bunch of others, so I, but I had to simplify. So as you can see, plurals are have a lot of complexity in Gaelic. And if you study the Gaelic from older native speakers of Gaelic, the ones who were born speaking the language, you'll see that a bun uh, many of the plurals are made with suffixation, but the majority are made through irregularity, through one of these um, other mechanisms. For example, the suppletion, which is completely irregular. However, with the remembers, more of the plurals are made with the simple suffix. Fewer are made with the irregular, uh, suffixes or with the other mechanisms. And there's a new type of word which has no morphological change from the singular to the plural, which makes the plural with zero. This essentially means that people are forgetting how to make the plural as the generations progress. So this is a kind of uh, structural change that we see during language shift. If we want to figure out what's happening to a language, we need to measure its vitality. And in order to measure this, this is not going to be like a number. You have to consider a lot of factors. For example, whether parents are transmitting the language to their children. How does the community feel towards its own language? Does it feel it's useful, it's valuable for preserving tradition? Or are they so discriminated against that people just kind of want to lay low and forget the language? Uh, what, how many speakers are there? And what is the percentage of speakers that, uh, that the language has out of all of the population? Are there any materials for teaching literacy, for example? And is the language available in new domains in media? For example, in technology, can you use it on, to chat on your phone? Can you use it to listen to radio, watch TV, and so forth? What is the attitude of the government towards the language? And are they uh, willing to provide resources to run schools that can help uh, bring vitality to the language? Um, there's different scales for how to measure vitality. This one's used by UNESCO. A language is thought to be safe if all the generations speak it. As you can see, there are, uh, languages can become vulnerable or endangered if the subsequent generations begin to lose the language. And where there are no speakers left, we'd call that language a dormant language.
which again supposes that in the future it could be reawakened. By the way, this is the situation in the US. The US has about 175 indigenous languages, and unfortunately in the next 20 years, as many as 50 of them could go dormant because they have only a few elders that speak them. Um, these are some of the largest languages in the country. Navajo has about 170,000 speakers. It's by far the most spoken language. And then after that, they're spoken by maybe 10 or 15,000, as, as are the cases for Tohono O'odham in Arizona, Western Apache also in Arizona, Yupik in Alaska, and Choctaw here in the South. Hawaiian, by the way, depends on the measure. It's spoken by either 2,000 native people, people who were born native speakers, like speaking the language from birth, or 24,000 people, which is the, num the number of people that have learned it by being born and being spoken the language to, or by going to school and learning it. So language shift is what happens when a language is displaced in a society. It loses domains of usage so that it can be used less and less by the community. And there will be a point where the parents no longer speak it to their children. And after a few generations of this, only the elders will remember the language and they will eventually die. And when this happens, the language becomes dormant. We can measure this process by looking at the vitality of the language and analyzing how the community feels about the language and analyzing how it's used in the society. 